Let everything that has prayer praise the Lord. Let everything that has prayer praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. With all my heart, with all my strength, with all that I have, I will sing that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. There is a river that flows on strength from your heart. Canyons of mercy so deep I could never depart Oh Father, your wonders are endless Open my eyes to believe, awake my soul Let everything that has breath praise the Lord Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. With all of my heart, with all my strength, with all that I have, I will sing that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Heaven's on fire a lot with the brilliance of love. Oh, Father, your wonders are endless. Open my eyes to believe, awake my soul. Spread everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Spread everything. That has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. With all of my heart, with all of my strength, with all that I have, oh, I will sing that everything that has.
that has breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. With all of my heart, all of my strength, with all that I have, oh, I will sing that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and what before me, let me be singing when the Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His soul in me. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. 
spoken word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, it fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Till you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, ever-ending, reckless love of God your foes still your love far from me you've been so so good to me when I felt no worth you paid it all for me been so, so kind to me. Hold me overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down and fights till I find peace in 99. Oh, I couldn't don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God
No shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me No wall you won't kick down Fire you won't sit down Coming after me That's right There's no shadow you won't light up Or oh, coming after me No wall you won't kick down, but you won't. Oh, with one voice, come on. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. We're going to sing one more song together as we do that. Um, we'll have a time of offering together. I hope that a time like this where it's kind of just stripped down, acoustics, just our voices, nothing too fancy about it. You know, for me, this is a great reset. And I kind of use this time between Christmas and New Year's where I'm like not ready for real life again. You know, I'm like trying to like have an adult Christmas vacation, like no school or something at least in my head. And I've learned to use this time to just reset, to think about the last year, to actually find reasons to be thankful, to look ahead to what I feel like God has been placing in my heart for the next year. And so I would encourage us in this time to find a moment to slow ourselves down, to even as the baskets go around, you know, it's an opportunity for us to give, but it's a reflection of who God is. It's a reflection of, of his generosity toward us. And so whether or not you put something in there, it's an opportunity to be thankful as that basket passes from your hand to the next. Thanking God for his generosity toward us. Endless generosity toward us. We just celebrated the ultimate gift. The gift that trumps all gifts, right? This gift in Jesus that could pay the price of our sins that we couldn't pay back. And our faith is built upon that gift. We worship because of that gift. So use this time to find some rest in the Lord this morning to be reminded of who you are and who he is. Lord, we thank you for the gift in Jesus. That we can depend on you. We can trust in you. 
And Lord, sometimes we need to be led to an obedient place even to receive the gift that you have for us, to not resist it, but to open ourselves to, to your grace, to welcome in the forgiveness that can actually transform us. So this morning, Lord, I ask that you would just change lives, transform us. Let this not be a routine or a ritual, even religion. Let it be a faith and relationship. Pray this in your name. Amen.
Lord, we thank you for this day, this gift of rest, Lord, and we ask that you would speak to us, be our source of truth and wisdom, our source of love and grace, Lord, we depend on you and your spirit. We don't pray to remain the same, but we pray for transformation. We may have already chosen to follow you, but we are certainly not done changing and growing, Lord, and so we give ourselves to you. We worship you because you alone are worthy. We celebrate you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Man, so good to join with all of you in worship. I hope that you had a great and wonderful Christmas. I know some of us are recovering from Christmas. I am recovering from the day after Christmas sickness, so... Maybe you're enjoying the lower keys. You're like, Brian sings too high every week, so. But needless to say, always glad to sing with you guys. Before you take a seat, say hi to someone. Ask them how they're doing. Take a minute to get to know one another. We'll start shortly. Guys, how we... Man, and Brian fired the band, huh? What happened? Where'd they all go? <laughs> it's 2020. Things are changing now. Starting fire already, getting in the pulpit. Guys, let's pray. Lord, you are good. And God, we bring so much to you right now. The past year, the past decade, or the past day. Whatever it may be, Lord, we bring it into this room, into this place, and say, Lord, would you just begin to lead and direct? What do you have for me, for my family? For those around me, God, where I work, where I live, how I love. God, would you speak to us today? Let my words hit the floor and Holy Spirit minister to your people. In Jesus' name we pray and say, amen. amen. So guys, how are we doing? If you need a Bible, raise up your hand. We will get you one. Hopefully some of you are new and you are here from the Christmas Eve service. Amen. If not, let's pray for everyone that came at the Christmas Eve service, that they show up again before the next Christmas Eve service. Amen. Got a couple hands in the back over there. But guys, are you ready to get into this? And by that, what do I mean? Are you ready to be done with 2019? Some of you are going to shout, amen. Are you ready to be done with this decade? Some of you have had a crazy time. Marriage, family, kids, life, diagnosis, the passing of loved ones, we acknowledge all of that. Some of you have seen how the Lord has worked in your life, and I want you to know as we start this that God is a God of time. He cares about days and weeks and months and years. He cares about so much, and so where I want to go today, and what I felt like the Lord was saying is you say, well, Brian, what do you mean is heading into 2020, where are we going And I don't mean as branches and as the team begins to lead and direct. I mean, where are you going? Where am I going? In my home, with my kids, with my time, with my resources, with all the things that God has entrusted to me. I say this because as I travel a lot, sit in many churches, around many lead pastors, see so many different camps and representations of the Spirit's work. So many times you see Christians getting sidetracked. We get sidetracked with the chaos of life, guys. Life is important. It's great to make money, to enjoy things, to go through the ups and downs, but there is a certain call. And so some of you saying, bro, it's early and I've had one or two coffee, maybe too many donuts if you're like me with a one pack. Amen? (laughs) Don't laugh at me, you guys. But I'm saying that to say it's okay to do some food inspection at the end of the year, at the end of a decade. It's okay to say, Lord, what are you doing? And I say this for this reason. If I say, what is Christianity? You know what we tend to do? We think about where we go to church. You think about our translation of the Bible. You think about your favorite worship song or a book you read. You think about all these things. I have friends who would love nothing more than to sit in the front row of a church and go through expository preaching for decades. And I love that stuff. And I love the Greek. And I love knowledge. But if I went out into the parking lot and talked about your car and said, this was from here in the Greek. And this part was made here, and I diagnosed the whole thing, having more knowledge than anyone, but didn't ever get in the car and drive it. Did it really benefit me? Is head knowledge good unless I live into it? And likewise, we can go to church saying, I have to feel the Spirit's presence today. I have to have an emotional interaction. And I love those moments. I love those interactions. Amen? 
But if the goal is just for me to hear something, have this experience, and constantly upkeep with God, but never go and take it anywhere, is that really what God has for me? What I'm saying is it shouldn't be that hard for me to have known the past decade what God wants of me. Should it have been that hard to know this past year or go into 2020 what the Lord has for me? Does he actually have a plan? And we can summarize this in a practical way. If I say what is Christmas about, what is it about? It's about baby Jesus, right? It's about home alone Jesus. And we joke about, you know, Will Ferrell tell they goodnight Jesus. It's about baby Jesus. And we have that verse on our card. Isaiah 9, unto us a child was born. And we put it on our cards. And I'm thankful, God, that you came as a child and that you came born of a virgin. And you lived this radical life that I couldn't live. And that you died for me and you. Can you say amen? Amen. For 40 years of opposing God, even as a believer, wrestling with Him. Lying, lusting, struggling, challenging. And as a believer, I'm away from those things. I fight against those things. I get it. I'm trying to live that way. But in everything I've ever done, I don't see Him as a child today because He's no longer a child. Who do I see Him as? A king. The king of kings and the Lord of lords. The one who is sitting right there with you in that chair. Comforting you. Holding your hand. Leading you into 2020. But when we read this verse. We think of a child. And it's Christmas. And it's simply a song or a book. Or a theme that we see. Maybe a meme. But is that what Isaiah is saying? When you read this verse in Isaiah 9 and 6. I'll say this ahead of time. I am probably going to hit so many verses. So it's one of those sermons where I would just. Listen to what I'm saying. Listen to the sermon later online if you want notes. Amen. Because when Isaiah talks about this child, what is he saying? He says in Isaiah 9 and 6, Unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. But he goes on. He says, And the government will be on his shoulders. The government on a child? How does that make sense? He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. But we only ever focus on what? A child. Yes, he came as a child, but he's not a child today. He's not even that shepherd carpenter that we picture, beaten and abused. Who is he today? The Bible says he's a healer. He's a provider. He's a strong tower. He's in who you take refuge. He's who went to one of these crosses and his flesh was shed abroad for you and me. In fact, the Bible even says that many, when they hear his voice for the first time, they will tremble. The picture you get of Jesus today in the book of Revelation, this is him. I'll go there for you for lack of time. Revelation 19.11. It says of Jesus that I saw heaven standing open and before me was a white horse and his rider was called Faithful and True. And with justice he judges and wages war. Radical. His eyes are like blazing fire. His head are many crowns. And verse 13 says he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood radical and his name is the word of God the armies of heaven are following him riding on white horses and verse 15 says coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations he will rule them with an iron scepter and he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God almighty crazy right I mean put that on a Christmas card Merry Christmas grandpa he will rule them with an iron scepter Hey, mom, just checking in with you before the coming wrath of God. (laughs) Well, that sounds radical, and you said, oh, this guy's one of those preachers. No, this is Bible preaching right here. But what I mean by that is, I'm not saying that to shock us. I'm saying that to say, is it possible that we're missing something? If we're honest, and you and I go and get coffee in a moment, and we talk about the nation of Israel, we say, well, Israel missed certain things. They missed what Isaiah told us, that unto us a child is born. They missed the young woman, the Alma, gave birth to this perfect son who never sinned and redeemed what was lost through Adam, the second Adam. Amen? But if I'm honest, I think we got the child, but we forgot what Israel is waiting for, and we're missing it. And as we head into 2020, I think we need to grasp hold of it and thrive in it. Amen? What do I mean by this? What I mean by this is when you hear about this verse, unto us a child is born, that there's a government, it'll be on his shoulders, that he will be this wonderful counselor. I mean, my children are what, 9 and 12, and they've never really counseled me in much, so how is baby Jesus going to do this? It says he's a mighty God, an everlasting father, a prince of peace. I mean, what is this prophecy about? It's about a kingdom. 
It's not just about King Baby Jesus. It's about a kingdom. And in fact, if I said to you, what is the kingdom of God? What would we say? In fact, if we went even further and jumped into the glory and flew back 2,000 years back to the future, amen, and we were there on the hillside and we caught up with Jesus by a stream or a brook or in the synagogue or wherever, I want you right now just to picture Jesus preaching and we just show up right next to him. What is he preaching about? What you picture him preaching about is what we understand about Jesus. What is he saying? What is he talking about? What is he focused on? And you know what it is? He's speaking in what? Parables. And what are the parables about? The prodigal son and the pearl of great price. And we see this. The sheep and the goats, the talents, the seeds, over and over and over. But what do we miss? Every single one of them is about the same thing. What are the parables about? The coming what? Kingdom. They're all about the kingdom. The Gospels talk about the kingdom 126 times. Jesus preached about the kingdom 50% of the time. 55 times the gospel and the kingdom is represented in Matthew alone. Why? Because Jesus is a king. We get that. But he's also coming with a kingdom and God has always been about his coming kingdom. It began in Genesis, and I want you to see this. We were with God in Genesis. God was with us, Emmanuel, you could say. And God created a kingdom for Adam and Eve. And what did he do? He put them in there where they could dwell with God, and they could walk in dominion with God. And God wanted it to be their kingdom as much as his. How do we know? Because in Genesis 1 and 28, he says to Adam and Eve, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish. And he goes on. How many of you guys know you were called to rule? Amen. You've been walking around your whole life thinking you're a ruler. And you know what? God thinks you are. You just happen to live in a simple and fallen world. Amen. If you go out surfing this week and drop in on everyone and snake them and say, well, Pastor Brian said I'm a ruler. That is not what I mean. Amen. You come back with a black eye. That is on you. Paul said some things are not beneficial. But he said, I want you to rule over it. And so what did they do? They said, we're not going to rule God's way, we're going to rule our way, and they fell in the sin. And soon there was birth another kingdom, in which all the women in childbirth have pain, and all the women said, amen. amen. And the men said, amen, amen. <laughs> but the men by the sweat of their brow, this is the other kingdom, the fallen kingdom. But God is faithful. Even though he put them outside of the garden, what did he begin to do? He spoke to a man called Abraham and said, you will have multitudes as numerous as the stars or the grains of sand on the shores. That's his coming kingdom. And then the enemy shows up again in this fallen kingdom. You have Pharaoh and the kingdom of darkness. Whether you say Egypt or Babylon, it is throughout human history. You are sitting in that kingdom even to this day where God begins to speak. And he begins to speak to Moses and Aaron. Go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go that they may what? Worship me, reconciling them unto himself, the kingdom. But Pharaoh doesn't listen. I don't know who this God is. And so God in turn brings plagues. God in turn parts the Red Sea. And we see the people delivered. God opposes evil. He speaks life as truth. So if we look at this story, what do we know about Egypt, about Israel? We know that God has sent a kingdom and there's a coming kingdom. Because if you were a Jew in that day, if you were a Hebrew, you would have been raised thinking about certain verses. And the fact that God even spoke to Pharaoh, the Bible says God hardened his heart. But Pharaoh also didn't receive the word of the Lord. Amen? The Bible says if you hear his voice, don't harden his heart. So yes, God hardened his heart. But God was speaking life to him. And he'll speak life to you and me. But if we reject it, our hearts will grow hard to the things of God. Someone maybe needed to hear that today. Amen? To Israel, though, the point is this. They understood stood there was a kingdom. This is what it says in Psalm 45, 6. Your throne, O God will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. Psalm 103, 19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. But as time goes on and Israel doesn't listen, their kings fall and man gets mad at at man, but overall, you know who's faithful? God. God continues to be faithful and now he begins to speak prophetically into 2,000 years ago in our day and age. Zechariah 14.9 says, The Lord will be king over the whole earth. That's a prophecy. And that day, on that day there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. 
Even Isaiah followed the verses on from that child given unto us. It says in Isaiah 9, 7, Of the greatness of his government and peace there shall be no end. He will reign on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice, righteousness from that time on forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Daniel 2 and 44, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor will it be left to one of the people. It will crush all those other kingdoms that's both in the physical and the flesh, spiritual we see it, and bring them to an end. And listen to Micah 4, 1 and 3. In the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and the people shall stream to it. Many nations will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, for he shall teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Who's this about? It's Jesus. So see, if we were to go today to a Jew, to a Hebrew if we were to sit in here as someone who was an unbeliever, not a Gentile, who didn't know who Jesus was, and you said, what is the gospel? The word gospel, what does it mean? We know this, the good news. So if I stop you on the way and say, hey, I've got good news, and then walk off and go do whatever, I didn't give you the good news, I just told you I have good news. So when you go to a Jew and you say, what's the good news? You know what they say? That a king is coming and his kingdom is coming with him. In Jerusalem, what are they waiting for today? A king, and what is the evidence he's a king? That he is bringing a kingdom. And for you and I, we have to say, well, is Jesus really this king? And did he really bring this kingdom? And if I was going to get advice from anyone, I would look for who? A wise man or a wise woman. And all the women said, amen. So a bunch of wise men showed up 2,000 years ago. And it wasn't just three, like many believe the Bible says. It was hundreds, perhaps thousands And these were the Magi who came from everywhere. They came to that town. They came because Matthew 2, 1 says this. As the wise men showed up, they said, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star. I mean, he's a toddler and he has a specific star doing a work for him. That's the God we serve if you're going through the midst of it right now. Amen. We saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. Where is the toddler born king of the Jews with a star? And what did they bring to him? Gold. Why? Because he's royalty. They knew the king had arrived. They knew what was going on. So we've got our king. And what does the Bible begin to say? And I'm focusing on Matthew. Tells us in Zechariah 9.9. That your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. And he did this when? On Palm Sunday. He will rule and extend from the sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Here's our king. He's riding in. You say, Brian, I get it, but here's my point. Have we missed the kingdom? Have we missed how we're meant to live into 2020? Because when John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, spoke of Jesus, what did he say in Matthew 3, 1? John came preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is what? Near or at hand. John the Baptist is captured, he's put in prison, he's going to have his head cut off. And in Matthew 4, 17, it says that because John was captured from that time on, Jesus began to preach. What did you preach, Jesus? Well, I preached repentance for the kingdom of heaven is what? Come near. Here comes Jesus, a king, preaching a kingdom. And even later when Pontius Pilate would say, are you a king? What did he say? My kingdom is not of this what? World. The story of Matthew is is a toddler king coming, given goal, rising up, living his life. We hear about a kingdom. And then what we catch in Matthew 4 is a very famous verse. I'm trying to paint a picture for you to put the whole of the New Testament together before the epistles in a sense. As Jesus is walking the shores, now establishing he's a king, he calls the fishermen. And what does he say? Follow me. Come into my kingdom. Come be my disciples. And I'm going to make disciples of you. I will make you fishers of men. I will show you this kingdom. Show me, Jesus. Matthew 4, 23. And so Jesus went throughout Galilee. That's the region. Teaching in the synagogues. What did he teach? Proclaiming the good news of the what? Kingdom. And healing every disease and sickness about the people. 
And news of him spread all over Syria. People brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering with severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. What he's doing and saying, here's the king, here's the coming king, here's the star, here's the gold. Now he's this 30-year-old carpenter who's got a three-year ministry and he's performing signs, miracles, and wonders. Why? To say the kingdom's here. All the promises God was making in the Old Testament that one day he would wipe away every tear, there'd be no more death, there'd be no more pain, no more cancer, no more suffering, no more of the craziness you were going through. Jesus is beginning to manifest parts of it. Why? Because he's demonstrating who he is. Even a second later, he casts out a demon. He goes into the synagogue and he's preaching in here. And people are flocking. Hundreds of people are showing up. Is this the king? But what are they thinking? Is this the kingdom? They're not thinking of individually stopping each person and saying something specific. Though that is part of the gospel. Amen. They're thinking of this coming, arriving, changing time, kingdom. And when you go into 2020... That's how we need to be entering. They're thinking of this kingdom, and so Jesus continues. Follow me, Luke 4, 38. Jesus left the synagogue, and this gets radical. And he went to the home of Simon, and Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. And so they asked Jesus to help her. This gets crazy. So he bent over and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Was it a demon? Was she sick? I mean, was there sin? No, he just spoke to a fever. And however that fever heard what he did, it left. That's quite kingdom-minded. Amen? And I love this part. She got up at once and began to wait on them. So the second Jesus healed her, she got up and made them what? Fish and chips or fish tacos or something. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. And we all know Jesus likes fish. So why not have some wahoos? Amen? <laughs> wahoos. Rebuke the fever and began. And what does it say in verse 40? And guys, just so you know, that really isn't in the text. That's the Brian version. It says in verse 40, at sunset, and the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness. And he laid hands on each of them and healed them. And moreover, which means, guys, listen to what he did. Listen to how this kingdom invaded. Demons came out of many people and they shouted, you are the son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. You see, people would want to king him. They wanted to crown him right then, but he had to go to what? The cross. There'd be no life, death, resurrection if he was withheld. But at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place, and the people were looking for him. And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving. But what did Jesus say? I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns. Also... Because this is why I was sent. And so he kept preaching in the synagogues of Judea. He did perform signs. He did perform miracles. But all of these things were expressions of the one day coming kingdom. Where it will all be perfect and will all be risen in glory with Jesus. Amen. But the goal of this is to proclaim the gospel. The reason why the kingdom is coming is because as he traveled, you know what he said? For this reason I was sent. To seek and save that which was what? Lost. Here's a king bringing a kingdom, and the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit was there to affirm his messianic credentials. Think about John the Baptist, even his cousin, who saw Jesus. He baptized Jesus. The Spirit descended in the form of a dove. Yet here's John in prison. He's saying, Is Jesus the one? Is he the one set apart? And how does Jesus tell him that we know he's the one? He says this in Luke 7. It said, John's disciples told John about all these things we can say that Jesus was doing. And so calling two of them while he's in prison, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? The one who is to come, the expected one, is a term for Messiah. Are you him? Let me know, yes or no. And Jesus doesn't tell him that. It says, when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who is to come or shall we expect someone else? At the very time, Jesus cured many, there's the kingdom, who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits. He gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to them, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard, the deed and the word. That the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, 
the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to who? The poor. Go back and tell them that you've seen the kingdom. But here's the idea. What we've done in the West is we've made the gospel very personal to me or just to you. It is about Christ and Christ crucified, but I came to faith in 2004, so I am not trying to sit back and say, Lord, rapture me out of here or get me to heaven one day. As much as it's about the kingdom of God and repentance, amen, it's about living in the kingdom. It's about allowing the kingdom to be here and not yet. We're not fully there yet. I'm still dying right now. My body is aging. How many of you guys know you're going to die one day? 20 of you. Well, for the rest of you, sorry for the bad news. <laughs> well, you better plan to be washed in the blood of Jesus. Amen. But here's the reality. Is the gospel to a Jew isn't, have you repeated this prayer and do you know you're bad? They got it. They knew that. They had the Ten Commandments, 613. They tied around their old necks. They knew that. The gospel was, here is this king, and we've been given this kingdom, and now we're going to take it out and live it. If you're like me, more of an evangelist, you know the verses about the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, from 1 to 5-ish, Paul breaks it down. The gospel message is that Christ died for us, for our sins, according to the scriptures. Verse 4 said that he was buried, which means he actually died. And the next part is that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared to many. The gospel is he lived, died, rose again for every person in this room. If you just strolled in today, you are having a great day because you are hearing the good news that when you die, you can be forgiven of all your sin by the grace and mercy of God. You are welcome. Amen. I wish someone would have told me that before I was 24. My life was upside down and crazy. But we hear that verse and we go, well, that's the gospel. But here's what's amazing. If you continue on in this verse to 24, we see this amazing picture of the end of time. If we want to be an end times church, and like Pastor Bobby said, talk about the rapture. Hey, we'll talk about whatever, but here's what's amazing. It tells us in 24 that when the end comes, and this is in 24 of 1 Corinthians 15, it says he will hand over the kingdom to God the Father. And after he has destroyed the dominion, all authority and all power. That means from the moment Jesus came, the kingdom was showing up and like a mustard seed, it will go out into all the world and all of his people have to hear his voice and come to faith. Amen? The picture of a mustard seed isn't that I'm sitting here and I'm comfortable and thank you for 2019 and I hope my life works out. The picture is we're going to move the gospel forward. This is why it says in Psalm 110.1, David speaking about God speaking to Jesus. And the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. You see, I don't say I came to faith at 24. I say, Lord, what did you have the last decade? What did you have in 2019? What do you have in my place of business? What do you have in my marriage? What do you have on my campus? What do you have with all this progressive thinking and things that are happening around our nation? Are we more bent out or frustrated? Are we more empowered to say, Lord, we are called to bring the kingdom He didn't call them to follow him to then sit around and say, what are we doing? And I'm speaking to myself saying this, Lord, what do you even want to do next year? We're not freaking out because of what's going on with politics and culture and the world. We are walking with the king and we have the kingdom. And here's the idea. Is if we really want to ask God, what do you have next year? Why don't we just simply ask that prayer? Why don't we say, Lord, why doesn't your kingdom come? And you know what? Let your will be done. On what? earth as it is in heaven that prayer doesn't mean wait till the kingdom comes then we're done what it means is let's pray your kingdom into where we live and begin to take the kingdom and walk in love and yes preach repentance like i said i wish someone would have stopped me and said do you know why your life's so crazy why because you're born in sin you live for yourself you care about the other kingdom you don't want to follow god I wish someone would have said, when you die, you're already guilty. John 3, 18 says that. We're already condemned the second we're born. That's why we die. But God sent his son so we can be redeemed. But we say, your kingdom come, your will be done. And rather than sitting back, what are we meant to do? Do something with it. And here's the idea, and we have to remember this. That Jesus called them to follow him and fish. He showed them how to do it. And then he died and resurrected. And he showed up with them again in the famous verse in Matthew 28. And you know this verse, but what did he say? It said, then Jesus came to them. 
So guys, you've been living in Jerusalem. We've had all these experiences, the parables. We know the kingdom's coming, but it doesn't make sense. And now he dies and resurrects, walks up to you and my, me, and he says this, verse 18. It says that Jesus came to us, we can say, and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given, therefore what? Go. And what are the two things you want to focus on? Make disciples of all what? Nations. Make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We know these parts. Teaching them to what? Obey everything I have commanded you. It isn't just to go. I mean, that's my protocol. Go. Go. Be going. Live a life of going every day. But he said, go to the nations. Go and obey. And I want to focus on these two parts. If you're waiting on a rapture or tribulation and thinking, God, take me out of here. I mean, I get it. The bills show up. We get crazy at times. I mean, life's chaotic. I wish I'd be raptured out of here sometimes. Anyone with me? Amen. But the Bible actually teaches this. It says in Matthew 24, 14, when thinking about the nations, we want to be an end times church then? Here's my sermon to all the end times churches. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. I'm still in the car park talking Greek, not in the car driving it. I'm still waiting for an experience without going with the kingdom. He literally says the end will not come till I go with nations. And if I take my personal Christianity and that God, you redeem my life and my marriage and bless us with more children. God, you're so good. But I just hold on to it. When I go to China, you think I'm going to affect the nation. When I go to Afghanistan, when I go to Liverpool, when I go downtown, what am I bringing my own personal faith? Or am I going as an ambassador of Christ, gifted to the body? Am I going bringing the kingdom? You see, if I go into a nation and just say, I'm a Christian here, I smuggle my Bible in, that's great for me. But I'm literally called to go and bring the kingdom. That's why the Bible says things like this, that the righteous will remain in the land, the meek will inherit the earth. I have a friend that's been in Thailand for nine years, and all he does is talk to Buddhists who've never heard the gospel, and that kingdom is invading because they've never heard of a king and never seen the gospel. I don't know if I said it in this service or the one before, forgive me, but growing up in England, I never met one Christian. I met one Mormon, one Jehovah Witness. I never met a Christian till I came to America. It's crazy to me that people are sending missionaries to England, and you know where else? To America. When I go to another nation, is the kingdom invading because I'm going to say things that is going to get the attention of leaders? That's what happened to Jesus. He wasn't crucified because he was nice. He wasn't crucified because he fed the 5,000 and gave them Wahoo's fish tacos. That wasn't it. He blasphemed, they said, which he didn't because he was God. Amen? But also they knew there was enough evil. And was he going to become the king? Was he going to stir up the people? Was he not bringing a kingdom? And I say this for this reason. Because I think about the apostles in my 2020. I loved that the apostles, when they were told off for preaching about Jesus, they said, as for us, and we want to ask ourselves that, as for us, as for us, we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. I can't stop speaking about the king and his kingdom. I can't stop speaking about salvation. I cannot stop. I'm not saying blab it all day, but I'm saying, as for me, is that my 2020? As for us. Guys, Branches is just the name of a church. Rock Harbor, Calvary Chapel, whatever is relevant. No, it's am I a Christian? And then it's am I following the king? Where is the kingdom going because of me? Where is the kingdom going because of you? Because you're the vessel. You're the chosen priesthood, the royal and the holy. You're the one set apart. And look at what he says next. He says, calling them to obey. Guys, you've got to get this. Some of you are trying to live your life so perfect so that God is happy with you. That is called religion. God loves you because Jesus died for you. Get over yourself. Amen. You need to release yourself from that. Your righteousness didn't save you, and it's not going to keep you. I love what John MacArthur says. If you're going to lose it, you would. You think you've been that perfect since you came to faith? No. God has got a hold of you. He's washed you in the blood. But what he's called us to do now as far as obey him is to what? Love the Lord your God with heart, soul, mind. And your neighbor is yourself. God, what do we do? How do we go to China and bring the kingdom? How do we live in Huntington Beach and bring the kingdom? Well, it's amazing if you think about how God works. You'd be surprised to know he's a God of order. Amen? I mean, he starts in Matthew 1 talking about a baby. Matthew 2 is about the king who's a baby. Matthew 3 and 4, he talks about his kingdom coming. 
And now he's talking about how his kingdom is going out in the earth. And what is Matthew 5 all about? Anyone know? What's the most famous sermon Jesus ever preached? The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, 7. You know in your Bible, those pages are all red. Do you know why? Because he is telling you how to live in obedience in the kingdom. We live like the Beatitudes that are some of the nation, some of the culture, who are meek and lowly, but this is to the believer. He's literally saying he's the child, he's the king, he's calling his disciples, he's going out and performing all these signs and miracles. And now, guys, when he talks about obeying us, obeying him, here's what he says, Matthew 5 and 2. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Beatitudes, it's about Jesus in word, and 7, 8, 9 is about indeed. Listen to who this is to. Is this not to me when I was dead in sin? Blessed are the poor in spirit, that's me, wretched and unrighteous. Blessed are those who mourn, that's me when I was divorced and suicidal and depressed. Blessed are the meek, that's me when I was humbled and said, I don't have any answers. If I had a gun right now, I probably wouldn't be here. That's where I was when I was 24. Life was crazy. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, guilty. Blessed are the merciful. Do I walk in that mercy? Blessed are the pure in heart. There's no one good, the Bible says. No, not one. This is only to the believer who's come to faith. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted, killed, slain, opposed for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of what? Heaven. The Beatitudes is our call to live this way in culture as someone's boss or to your boss. In your relationship, in the life that you live, how do we know? Because in Matthew 5, he continues on. You are the salt and light. And you know what he does? He speaks about anger and lust and retaliation. He talks about loving your enemies, giving to the needy, fasting, laying up treasures in heaven, not being anxious. 2,000 years ago, people knew that friends and family would be anxious, depressed, and sadly taken their lives. And he says, our house is built on the rock. The Beatitudes is to us. It's to us when we step into this. I mean, Matthew's title is the good news of the kingdom. And then go read Matthew 8 and 9. You know what this is? We're back to the black letters. Now, why? Because this is Jesus performing these things indeed. Paul said, whatever you do, Brian, whatever you do, branches, whatever you do, believer, for the king and kingdom, do it all in word and deed. Listen to his word, but go and live this. What is the picture of this sermon? It's that the world is falling apart. The kingdom of this world is falling apart. Satan has reign right now. It's radical. Everyone's willing this into existence. New age this, new age that. Chasing ourselves, lovers of self. We're all self-obsessed. Whether we're believers or not, it's getting on us in some sense. But God's kingdom is still invading. That mustard seed is still going. There's more Muslims who are believers today now in the faith. There's more in China. There's more throughout the world. God is constantly reviving hearts and souls every single day. Amen? But as I say, God, in 2020, and this is going to challenge us, I'm going to step on my toes right here if you're with me. I want to live the Beatitudes. Well, you read Matthew 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and it's also going to expose our hypocrisy. It's also going to expose our idolatry. It's also going to expose the things we live for that are going to be chewed up by the moth or worn down by the rust. It's also going to expose the things that we are thinking of this world rather than things that are above. And in fact, it will tell you of practical things too. Getting drunk, being physical outside of marriage, the things that we don't want to hear. And why does it say this to us? To help us navigate our loving father saying, son and daughter, this is not the way the kingdom works. I say this many times. I was standing there with my kid, and he suddenly started cussing at you. What am I going to do, hate my kid? No. I'm going to say, this is how you talk now. This is the way you treat someone now. This is the way you treat a brother and sister. That's called conviction. God is saying that to you and me in the areas we may be. I've called you to greater and deeper things. You know why so much of the church is upside down around the world? It's because we're wanting to read books for the sake of reading books. We're going to go to conferences for the sake of conferences. Go live the kingdom and you haven't got time for affairs or getting hammered drunk or embezzling money. Amen? You're focused on the kingdom. This is the reality of what he's saying. And here's the idea, though. Let's cut us all a little slack. Why would I even live this way, preacher? Why would I live this way last year? Why would I live this way in 2020? Why do I want the kingdom anyway? It's only one answer. The only reason I would want this kingdom is because what? Of the king. That while you and I were still sinners, Christ died for us. The only way I'd want the kingdom is because he saw you and me and said, Oh, no, 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 that's not good. 
I'm going to die in their place. That when Adam rejected Eve in the garden and said, God, it's the woman's fault. Jesus looked at you and I, the church's bride, and said, oh, it's her fault, all right, but I'm going to go in her place. It began in a garden with a tree, with the sweat of his brow, with the woman giving birth to the kiss, right? Through hair came that fallen sin nature of people through Adam. But it was redeemed and reversed because of a tree that Jesus hung on. Because of not the sweat of his brow, but the sweat of blood on his brow, the thorns, and that he was born of a virgin. It was all reversed. This is God's plan all along. And why would I possibly want to follow this king? Because Colossians 1.13 says, He has rescued you, Brian, you branches, you who put your faith in him. He has rescued us from the what? Kingdom, dominion. Control of darkness. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Can someone get excited? And he's brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. If your life is upside down, go read that verse 10 times. Just register what eternity will be like without Jesus. I don't even know what he really looks like. I don't know what his breath smells like. I've never really got to hold him. But I know he lived, died, and resurrected for you and me when we were far from him. Even when they came to him in Luke 17, they said, What is this coming kingdom? What is the sign of this kingdom? The Pharisees were challenging him. And what did he say? They asked, When would the kingdom come? And he said, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. You don't just see it stroll in. It's not a jumbo shot or a sign. He says, but nor will people say here it is or there it is. Because the kingdom of God is in your what? How is it in our midst? It's in our midst because the kingdom of God is wherever who is? Jesus. And what was Isaiah saying in that verse that we started with? Unto us a child is born. Why? Emmanuel, God with us. You see, the mystery of the Old Testament hidden and revealed in the New is Emmanuel. God was with them in the garden, but he wasn't in them. He was with them at the tabernacle, but he wasn't in them. He was with them in the temple, but he wasn't in them. And then the virgin born gave birth to the child. What? Jesus lived, died, resurrected. Why? So he could be in us. What is the mystery of the king and the kingdom? It's Colossians 1.26. I love that the Bible's this clear. God bless you. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people, that's us. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Why are we compelled to live this way? Because it's right. My flesh doesn't want to serve God. Does my wife want to come alongside me? Do my kids want to listen? Do we want to show up to church early? No, we've got flesh. We're wretched and wicked still. That's a part of our sin nature. Amen? But why do I hear this and does it wake me up? Why do you hear it going through whatever you're going through? The worst news you got? Because God is good. Because Jesus is king, because unto us a child is born. And if this isn't the rock that we stand on, whatever else you're going to grab a hold of is fleeting anyway. It's not going to stand. That's how the world's kingdom. And so what do we see in this? This is what was hidden in the Old Testament and is revealed in the New. But what do we grasp in this? The first thing is, do you know Jesus? Do you know him as king? Is he Emmanuel, God with you? And the second thing for us as believers is that you want to enter 2020 seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness. Do I have a better plan for you? Does my accountant or a business planner or someone have better plans than I do, but doesn't God have the best plan? Do you know him as king and do you want to seek first his kingdom? Because last time we checked, which was a moment ago, you don't have to go to the nations because America is a nation, but what would it look like for us, not as branches, but just as believers, to live into the kingdom? What would it look like for what you're going to face, the ups and downs, to hold on to the king as he shapes and leads your lives? Did you guys get what I'm saying in this? Let's bow our heads for a moment, and I want to get even more crazy for just a second. Did you come in here today and you don't know Jesus? Did you come in here today carrying sin separate from him and you just said, what is going on? It is alien. Apparently, I'm living in this kingdom, but apparently the Bible says there's another kingdom and a king And though I don't even know him, he lived, died, and resurrected. He shed his blood, and apparently right now, I'm still guilty. 
I want to tell you, friend, that you're a breath away from heaven or hell, whether you believe it or not. The Bible is true. And God has brought you here today to hear this message. And we don't want to end a service like this without inviting you to say, I hear the Lord. I hear his voice. I need to respond. Is there anything greater than ending this year, this decade, the chaos of your life and grabbing forth to the kingdom of God and Jesus and saying, Lord, I need forgiveness. We're all going to see each other at the finish line. But are you in here today and you say, I'm done playing around. I'm done seeking this world system. I need to get right with God. If that's you on the count of three, I want to pray with you in a moment. And if you know today you want to let go of that sin, receive of the blood of Jesus and be forgiven, forever innocent because of his work, would you just raise up your hand so we can pray for you on the count of three? One, two, three. Amen. Maybe you're in here and you say, Lord, I don't have it all figured out. I just want to be used by you. Help me to shape my business. Help me to shape my life, shape my marriage. Help me to shape whatever Brian isn't even talking about. But Lord, you know. Maybe you're just saying, Lord, help me to bring the kingdom in the way I live the Beatitudes. Not under compulsion, but Lord, lead me in the workspace where I pass time, in school, in college, in the home. As difficult as it is, Lord, I know we're flesh, but God, I need your help. If you just want to say, Lord, help me in those areas, you just raise your hand where you are. Just an act of faith saying, Lord, I know you see me, but God, I want to just stand. And I'd like to stand to our feet for a moment. I just want to pray for the few hands I've seen that were lifted, and the many hands that were lifted for about the kingdom. And I just want to pray us into this time, and then we're going to open up the crosses. Get to those crosses if you need prayer, if you need things to be prayed for into the next year. If you need to confess sin or say, I need help with this. Let's just extend our hands for a moment. God, we just acknowledge you. And we acknowledge the cross. That you lived for us, that you died for us, that you rose again. And God, every moment of my life is an invitation to be forgiven. And I pray, Lord, for those who lifted their hands, their faith would be in you. They would see their sin. They would see their need. And God, you would do a work in their hearts. God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the blood that you're alive today. But God, we turn to you, put our faith in you. We repent and ask for forgiveness. And Lord, I ask today, God, that for those who just said, Lord, would you use us? God, empower us as your people, as your vessel. You're the one who crafts and shapes us. And God, there's work to be done. And it is not a burden. It's a blessing. God, shape their businesses, shape their crafts, bless their talents, God, their artistic abilities, their voices, whatever they may do, no matter how big or insecure they may see it is all significant, God. If you were speaking about the woman with the two mites, how great for us to do anything in your name. But God, I pray in the next few moments as we begin to worship, as we open up these crosses for opportunities to receive prayer, would you begin to speak to your people like only you can? Meet us in those moments. We love the emotional part. If you want to speak in Greek, hey, let's do it and have someone interpret. We believe for that stuff. But God, I just ask right now as we leave this service in a moment, you begin to speak to us now. In your name we pray. Let's worship him, church. Amen. Lifting 
me up so I can stand and sing. I lift my hands, oh, I lift my heart to you. Sing that again this morning.
church. Let's give it up for the Lord. Amen. And guys, I, I pray that today as we leave, this isn't living this perfect life, have an understanding in every area. You're going to go out and as you ask the Lord to meet you in those divine moments, and isn't that there's divine moments? Your faith is a divine moment. Amen. Everywhere you go, the kingdom is with you. But as you're willing to step out and say this and current here, do this, some doors are going to open and some doors aren't. When those doors don't open, you dust your feet off and you keep going. But we need to say, Lord, there is a harvest. And we're praying and asking for laborers, but that's us. The ideas we have, the thoughts we have, look, where does the Lord call you this year? Get with leadership, get with the team. What does God want to birth? Since this church has been birthed, I've seen so much ministry just going from every kind of person and every kind of avenue. That's the heart of God, that the kingdom would go forth like that mustard seed. But I want to pray us out ending this year. Let's just extend our hands one more time. But I pray, and even selfishly, Lord, to bless your people. Give them wisdom and knowledge, God. Give them sympathy, compassion. But Lord, bless them in the things of this world at times. 1 Timothy 6 says, Command those who are wealthy or rich, God. Make them the number one CEO. Grow their business. Help them in their struggles in marriage, God. Bless and heal them. Every good and perfect gift comes from you, and we submit it all to your will. But God, shape and shake your people this year. Use this ministry, this church, your sons and daughters. And God, as I pray these next few days that are around family members still, there's opportunities to be loving God, that they would do that. They would walk in forgiveness, grace, and mercy. They would lift up your name because, Lord, you've left us here to help others enter the kingdom. You came to seek and save that which was lost. And, Lord, we are planted in a place where there's so many dead and lost around us. God, we lift you up and we thank you for your grace and mercy. Lead us, direct us. In Jesus' name we pray and say, amen. God bless you guys.